safety, you will ask you to note the position of the exit nearest where you are now seated. There are in all 10 exit doors from the concert hall, all of which are clearly marked. In the unlikely event of an emergency, please move calmly to the nearest exit and make your way to the outside of the building, following the instructions of the staff. Do not delay and do not return unless and until you are advised by the staff that it is safe to do so. We hope you enjoy the performance in comfort and safety. We request that all mobile devices and alarms be switched off for the duration of the performance. Thank you.
piece of music was from the beginning of an opera by Mozart called The Magic Flute, a story about good and evil and magical creatures. And that is the theme that binds our concert today. Magical, mythical creatures, all brought to life in sound. My name is Tom. This is our conductor, Gavin. And this magnificent body of people on stage is the RTE National Symphony Orchestra. And we're very, very pleased that you're here with us today. Now, did you know that this orchestra actually belongs to you? This is yours, all of you. All of you own this orchestra. It's a strange thought, isn't it? No one wrapped it up. No one gave it to you for Christmas, but this belongs to you. And as you own an orchestra and all the musicians in it, could you just say hello? Could you just wave and say, hello, NSO? <laughs> orchestra, could you wave to your new keepers? And as we are streaming live to millions of people all over the globe, could you also wave and say an enormous hello to everybody who's watching wherever they are? Good. Well, now we're all here, everyone's bezies, and we're ready to explore this idea of magical creatures in sound. It's an odd idea, isn't it, that we can bring things to life in sound with no words, but that's what orchestras do. They make us feel things and think things, imagine things. Stories come to life in our head just using sound. How do they do it? Because you know, if you were a writer or a poet, you'd have 26 letters in the alphabet to play with, wouldn't you? And depending on the order that you put those letters, you get different words. But order of words differently, you get different sentences, different meaning, different feelings in words. Well, a composer, a person who writes for an orchestra, they only have 12 notes. 12 notes. And they have to think very carefully about the order that they put them in or the way they colour them. You can see, can't you, that the orchestra are in different colours. At the front here, in red, are the string players, and in the middle are the blues, the woodwind players, and in white shirts over there are the brass players, and over there, quietly in the corner in grey, are the percussionists. And if we mix all of those colours together, we get different feelings, different sounds, different emotions. I'll show you what I mean. If we take something simple, a simple melody based on my name, Tom Redmond, and in sound, that could sound like this. T, R, E, D, M, O, N, D. My name. Now, if we add chords, more voices to that melody, then my name has harmony and it's more interesting to listen to. And if we add even more voices and more moving lines, like this, it's like my name has become three-dimensional. It's like you could look at it from every angle and see something new. And then if we add the woodwind instruments as well, like these great rainbows of sound. But if I wanted to sound really brave, really strong, I'd need brass. And if we put them all together... The silence of this many people with instruments is unexpected. 
and a powerful thing in music to make no sound at all. And after a little while, we feel uncomfortable, maybe even afraid. If we just use the extremes of the orchestra, the highest and the lowest of the strings, a tremolo makes us feel like we're shivering, an iciness to the sound. And if just a few instruments play, then there's a loneliness as well, almost an emptiness. We've lost the body. But then if we played my name slowly, it gives us time to think and to feel and wonder what it is that we need to get that big sound back again. And what we need is percussion. Because percussion brings rhythm and energy and drive. And if we have percussion and brass, I start to feel invincible, like I could do anything. And if we have faster notes in the violins, it gives me an energy to push forward and try and find that sound that was there before. Like this. So that's how an orchestra works. It's how we colour in the sounds that make us feel different things. Now, that piece of music was written by a very good friend of mine called Tim. And Tim is watching this somewhere near Liverpool in England. And I wonder if you could give Tim the most enormous cheer and a round of applause. Could you do that? Go now! Now, we're going to tell a completely different story now, but another story in sound, a story about witches and warlocks dancing on the side of a mountain. It's written by a Russian composer called Mazalski, and all he does is the same as what we just heard. He takes some musical ideas and then he plays with them. He colours them differently. He takes them in different directions. Now, at the beginning of this piece, we hear swirling mists and broomsticks flying overhead. And as those broomsticks fly, they're covering a landscape. And as they get closer to the mountain, it just seems to loom up out of nowhere. And we hear that in the lower sounding instruments of the orchestra. <laughs> Once they're there, amongst all that mist and on the mountain top, they start to dance. Witches and warlocks dancing and cackling. And we can hear them cackling in the woodwind section. So we're going to put those three musical ideas together and take you to a witch's party on a bare mountain.
I don't think that the witches and wizards in that piece were particularly nice ones. They remind me of Death Eaters. Bad magic. So maybe, to counter that, we should have some good magic. So, if you were to receive an owl delivering mail with an invitation to join Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, what four animals could you take with you as a pet? Shout it out, tell me. A tiger? Okay, yeah, yeah. I think I got that. So, owl is one, isn't it? Yes, owl. Cat. Rat. And a toad. Yes, a toad. So they are the four animals that you could take. But imagine, you can't take a tiger to Hogwarts with you. You're not allowed tigers at school. Any school, even magical schools. Unless you could transfigure them. Anyway, Imagine that you weren't just a first-year student at the school, but you were instead the headmaster, the most powerful wizard to have ever lived. What pet could you have then if you were Albus Dumbledore? Of course. A phoenix. Absolutely right. Yes, 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 yes. I got it. It's a phoenix. Yes. The most loyal of creatures heal you with their tears, can lift heavy loads and rejuvenate in a flash of flame. And we're going to play you music now that describes Dumbledore's Phoenix Forks. And this is the most magical sounding piece, I think. It soars through the sky, flying across the grounds of Hogwarts, effortlessly, carefree, looking down upon everything in that magical kingdom. And it's the most beautiful melody played by one of the most beautiful instruments, the cello. So I want you to watch the cellos over here as we soar over Hogsworth's Hogsmeade and play you music about a phoenix called Forks.
you did go to Hogwarts, there are some places that you can't go. The Forbidden Forest is somewhere where students mustn't go because the forest is full of magical creatures, some good, some bad. And forests have always had that magical association, magical creatures living in forests. And that's what we have in our next piece of music. It's music written by a composer called Mendelssohn. And when he was a boy, he used to love reading the plays of Shakespeare. And so he started to write music to go with some of those plays. A Midsummer Night's Dream was one of his favorites. Now, A Midsummer Night's Dream is ultimately a love story, but a love story that's complicated by the mischievous magical people, elves and fairies of the forest. And in an orchestra, we have mischievous magical people too. They're the woodwind players, and they sit in the middle of the orchestra doing mischievous magical mischief. And that's what you hear in this piece. They're sort of telling us basically what they've been up to, and none of it would be acceptable in a school. You know, if you behave like this at school, you'd have detention all the time. They're some of the naughtiest people in an orchestra. But what they're doing is answering a question, a question that's asked by another magical creature called Puck. And he says, how now, spirit, whither wander you? Thank you. 
two completely different sounds, isn't it? From the soaring sound of the strings as we listen to music about a phoenix to the mischievous sound of the woodwind as we meet the people of the forest. Well, our next piece is completely different again, and this time we're going to hear a lot from the percussion section. Sit in the back of the orchestra over there, wearing grey tops. And the percussionists, they're like the special effects department of an orchestra. And if you take them away, actually things just don't work. It's like watching a film without all the flashes, bangs and explosions. It's just not the same. They add their own special colour, their own textures to the music that we play. And in this next piece, they're very, very important indeed, as we bring to life a creature called an abawaku. Now, an abawaku is a mythical creature, a story that's been told for centuries and centuries and centuries. It's a creature that lives at the bottom of a spiral staircase. And this staircase leads to paradise. And every so often, a traveler will find this staircase and they start to climb it. And as they climb, the abawaku reveals itself. It's an invisible creature that lies at the bottom of the stairs, unseen until someone starts to step. And the abawaku is there to take them on, take them on to paradise, to the next life. And as the traveler climbs, the abawaku starts to reveal itself, it becomes slightly translucent, it starts to sparkle. You start to see more color. It's this electric blue. Its skin is as smooth as velvet, but sparkles like diamonds. And as the person gets to the top, the abawaku becomes clearer and clearer and more and more beautiful. But the thing is, no one's ever seen it in its fullest form because no one's ever been brave enough to step off from the top of the staircase. And then the traveler walks back down again. And as they walk back down, the abawaku recoils and starts to disappear. You lose all that color, you lose the sparkle, until it becomes invisible and lies sleeping, waiting for the next person. And that's what we hear in this music. And when we reach the top of the stairs, the percussionists have a very, very important part. This staircase is very, very tall, very, very high. And when you go very high, you get a lot of wind. So we hear this sound. The wind machine is the central point of this piece. And when we reach there, the music just goes in reverse. And everything we heard on the way up goes back down again. It's a musical palindrome. So watch out for the percussionists and watch out for the abawaku.
you've heard the orchestra play a lot, and you've given some good answers about magical creatures, but we haven't really heard you do anything yet, have we? I mean, we've heard strings and woodwind and brass and percussion, but there's one instrument that we haven't heard that all of you have, all of you are born with. What could that be? Your voices, of course. So, should we sing? Good. So can you all stand up? Up, 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 everywhere, 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 everyone's going to get up. Very good. And just shake your arms like this for me. And then shake a leg. And then shake the other leg. Shake both legs. Arms out in front of you like this. Arms up like that. Arms behind you like that. Shoulders round. Shoulders back the other way. Shoulders in opposite directions. Yeah. You think about that one for a minute, don't you? Okay, so shoulders are going, arms are relaxed, legs are relaxed. Now, could you all just say, ah? Okay. And if you're watching this online, can we hear you do that? Very good. Okay. Uh, and now, could you look up at the ceiling and go, All right, so there's the vocal warm-up done. That's very straightforward. Now, this is a piece that combines, you know, an orchestra and your voices. But for me, there's one thing, one thing that completes a triangle of humankind's greatest inventions, and that's dance. Music, song, and dance. They just go together. And so we're going to learn to dance. And as we're going to sing the Charleston champions, we're going to learn to Charleston. So first thing, okay, uh, turn that way. All right, and using your hands like this, I want you to imagine that you're being very helpful at home and polishing the table. Very good. Strings, you want to polish? No polishing in the bed. That's very good. Well done, very good. See, the orchestra can dance too. All right, now, with your feet, I want you to kick forward with your right foot like this, without hurting the person in front of you. All right, so kick, and then step back, and then step back again. And then step forward, step forward, kick, Back, back, step forward, kick, back, back, step forward, kick, back, back. And now, see if you can combine that with your polishing hands. All right, so here we go. We're going to go kick, back, step, step, kick, back, step, step, polish, kick, step. It's that straightforward. That's how you dance at Charleston. And people have been doing that for ages. Okay, so you've got the dance, and you've all got a book with all the words on. Is that right? Yeah. Are you ready to sing the Charleston Champions? Yeah. Hold up, Gavin. Sorry. I'm just going to remind you that you're not just singing it here, but you are singing this song all over the world. So, are you ready to sing? Yeah. Orchestra, are you ready to play? Yeah. Then let's Charleston! Showtime, dancers take your partners Strictly's dream teams will get this contest started Waltzes, tangos, rumbas, drives and sambas Whirl round the great glitter ball Best in the show is this dumb tornado Its style beats how was born in Carolina In the jazz age there was nothing finer Here's how this humdinger goes Charleston, Charleston Here we go with the hands and then, then a kick Step, 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 kick Step, step, good Let's go this way Step out, step in, keep those jazz hands waving Clown hops, knee drops Backflips, Charleston has the best tricks To top the grand leaderboard Spun heels, cartwheels, get the audience cheering Dance hard, leap large and don't forget to breathe in Stay sharp You'll get the freak. Charles 
Charleston, Charleston, crazy like a cartoon, fast beat, hot fun, let's dance. Here we go again, and a step, kick, step, 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 kick, step, 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 kick, step, 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 kick. Charleston, straight is greatest highlight. Judges all rush to get their highest scores out. They have no doubt if you get the star right, you'll lift the trophy and smile. Jazz hands! And now the knees! More hands, knees, hands, knees. And a kick, and a twirl! Charleston, Charleston, crazy like a cartoon Fast beat, hot fun, let's dance! Charleston, Charleston, crazy like a cartoon Fast beat, hot fun, let's dance! Much more applause than that. Give yourselves a round of applause. And let's have an even bigger cheer from the orchestra as well. All right. Well, you, well, you have sat down. Now you just get your breath back and we're going to play you more music. And this time, this is the only creature in this whole concert that's actually real. Except they haven't lived for millions and millions of years. They were only brought back to life through the magic of film and the magic of music. We're going to play music about any clues? Dinosaurs! Yes, yes, yes. Now, earlier on, earlier on we heard music by John Williams, who wrote the Harry Potter soundtrack. We heard Forks the Phoenix flying over Hogwarts. And this time, more music by John Williams as he brings dinosaurs to life. Now, the strings helped us fly. The woodwind helped us find mischief. The percussionists brought the abaraku to life. So there's one section left that we really need to hear. And in Jurassic Park, the brass instruments are maybe the most important of all.
Phoenixes and elves and mythical creatures and dinosaurs. We've heard the whole orchestra and we've only got one piece left. But before we play it, could you please give the most enormous round of applause for Gavin Maloney and the RTE National Symphony Orchestra? And just don't forget that this is yours. This is your orchestra. And as it says up there, you've got to love your orchestra to make them want to play. They need you. They need you to come and hear them. Sometimes they play great long symphonies. Sometimes you could come and hear the music we've played you today. Sometimes you could come and hear them play music to a film. A little while ago, they played the music with Jurassic Park showing on a big screen. They do everything. You have the most amazing thing. So please come and look after your orchestra. Now, we're going to finish with a fairy tale. A fairy tale which features, actually, a phoenix again. A firebird, a magical, magical creature. Now, if you were going to write a fairy tale, what words would you use at the very beginning? They're the only words that you could begin a story with, aren't they? Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there was an enchanted kingdom. It was a beautiful place, but a kingdom filled with sadness. The kingdom was ruled by an evil ogre called Koshai the Immortal, and he ruled that kingdom with fear. No one could do anything without Koshai's permission. Now one day into the kingdom walked a prince. His name was Ivan, and as he was walking around he met a princess. And the more Ivan and the princess spoke, well, they fell in love. So in love that they decided to get married. The trouble was, no one could get married, no one could do anything without the permission of Koshai. So Ivan went to the ogre and said, I'd like to marry the princess. And Koshai said, no. And he chased Ivan from the kingdom. But Ivan wouldn't give up. He was in love. So he enlisted the help of a creature called the Firebird. And the Firebird told Ivan the only way to rid the kingdom of Koshai was to destroy his soul, which he kept hidden in a golden egg in a tree stump. For many, many moons, Ivan searched the kingdom for that tree stump. I could never find it. Until one night, 
tired, hungry, he found himself in Koshai's lair. And there, on the floor, next to the sleeping ogre, was a tree stump. Tiptoeing as quietly as he could, so as not to wake up Koshai, Ivan leant down and pulled out a golden egg. And following the instructions that the firebird had given him, he held it tight, he closed his eyes, and when he opened it, something magical happened. As soon as Ivan opened the egg, the firebird soared high up into the sky, flying over the valley below, and everywhere the firebird flew, life returned to the kingdom. Rivers began to melt, flowers came into bloom, and people danced and celebrated and sang, and there, on the other side of the valley, was the princess, and they all lived happily ever after.